One, two, three. Welcome to Skilt. My name is Joe Austin. <laughs> I've just joined us. Can I remind you that Skilt is a joint production of Faults of Fears to Hear and Fail and Fall. Sometimes in life you wish you had this or you had that. If I was a if I was a minister or had any authority in government in the south of Ireland, my guess I'd put him in jail because he's broke more hearts than a, a Hollywood a movie star. <laughs> so, Tag Hickey, so welcome to Skilda. Hi, guys. Hi, Joe. It's great to have you here. I know that you've been doing it. I was nearly going to say welcome back to Belfast, but you've been in Belfast before and fallen in love with it by all accounts. Oh, Jesus. It's just trying to get out of it is the problem. Trying to get home once you're up here is, is tricky. Like, yeah, no, I know. I love this place. And uh, yeah, it's always great to be here. I was in Tyrone for a while there recently and I was in Derry, but it's just, it's just tough to beat the West. Okay, well, I, I hope when you were in Derry, you didn't say that Derry was the best place. Oh, I say that everywhere. Like, okay, I'm just trying to sell okay. tickets to shows. Well. Do you know what I mean? So like, Derry is, just if there's anyone from Derry listening as well, I just, like, you're my favourite. <laughs> <laughs> I should say that at some stage in your life you said you came from Cork. Uh, that was long before you discovered the North and Cork had been a, 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 a forgotten nightmare, maybe. I love Cork. I love Cork, but Cork is a very mixed place. Like, you can't, you can't really officially say that there's any problems with Cork when you're from Cork, because we have this kind of thing where, you know, in accordance with behind the walls of Cork, everything is perfect, it's a utopia. Mm -hmm. And I like that about it, up to a point. But um, as you know, I can be a little bit critical of things in my work, Absolutely. as I'm sure, as I know you are. <laughs> uh, and Cork isn't very interested in feedback. <laughs> well, I, I think many, many, perhaps many cities are like that. Mm. Uh, cities for me are, are, are really big villages just scattered around and, and they're all about. And Belfast is a bit like that. Belfast is a series of, of so small villages kind of linked and there's very distinct personalities and identities that go through those. And speaking of which, I was doing some research last night. I was trying to put, put a label on you, and it's, and it's quite difficult. You're a stand-up comedian. You're someone who is became, has become the talk of Tic Tac. You're a podcaster. I suspect, doing all of that and listening to some of your other podcasts, that there's a, there's a book rattling around somewhere in your head. Well, first of all, I've never, never known anyone to do such research in my life. Mm -hmm. That's fucking very impressive. Mm -hmm. uh, second of all, I've written a book that I'm proud to say has been rejected by every major publisher in the South. I'm now looking to the North. Shocker. Okay. Uh, you're right, though. The first, the first thing I've written is a kind of, it's a spoof because it's a self-help book, but it's a self-hindrance book. So it's a joke. Like, it's how to wreck your life uh, in 12 foolhardy steps. And as somebody who's openly in recovery from alcoholism, um, you know, I think you'll get that we're very good at wrecking our own lives. But uh, so that's the first idea. But there's probably several books there. But yeah, like you touch on the fact that there's a load of things. I, I never set out to be like this. Is, I'm going to be one thing. I don't like that idea. I don't like being put in a box. I did stand up for a while. I enjoyed it up to a point. The terror of being on stage and trying to, to tell people that you're so funny you have to listen to me for half an hour. I got sick of that. I also got a little bit tired of standing on stage and doing a funny bit and then there's an next funny bit and that has no relationship to the first bit. Now I'm not knocking stand up. I'm not here to say that stand up is over or anything. It's thriving and it's doing very well without me. But I like to have a start, a middle and an end. So I've ended up doing a type of theatre that's like partly theatrical and part stand up. So. Look, without sounding too pretentious, I kind of like to try and look at the way things are and see, do I have anything to offer? Maybe I could put a new slant in it. So I wondered, for instance, like about a year ago, I was like, I wonder, could I make comedy that also captures the fact that I'm really interested in politics, yeah. I'm really interested in geopolitics, um, I don't like oppression like a lot of people, and I'm also interested, as I know you are, that there's all these things going on in the world and that the average guy in the street, which would include me, doesn't tend to know about them. Can I do that through comedy? And I wasn't at that point thinking at all, do you know, I'd, geez, I'd say this would really take off now, like, shocked, I was shocked it's, yeah, it's that it amazing. took off. It's <laughs> amazing, and, and you know, I, I jokingly said in the introduction that if I was a minister in, in government in the South, <laughs> I'd put you in jail, I would put you in jail. I think you've broke more hearts, and I, I have to say <laughs> I, that it is so sharp, it is so sharp and so to the point that it, it's a nightmare, it's great if you're, if you're on, the good side of it, but if you're on the other side of it, what is the journey? Tell me first of all about you, and I should, what I should have said as well is that you're a community and political activist, 
as well as all of the above. But what was that journey? How did you become interested in the North at a time when the Northerners are told in the South nobody cared? Like, I, I think my own alcohol story as well is very much connected to it because I feel like when I was in college and I started reading about British imperialism, American imperialism, I was like, well, I'm, I'm interested in this. I'd always been interested in the North since I was a kid. I watched uh, Jerry Adams being uh, ambushed on the Late Late Show in 1994 in an interview and I was sitting down on the ground, I was like, you know, six or seven years of age. I wasn't in a Republican family at all. Uh, the North, to me, as I was kind of saying to people in Fela at that point, I was living in a jurisdiction where the North it might as well have been uh, Timbuktu. We, mm -hmm. just, we just didn't understand. There was violence going on up there. We were kind of led to believe that, you know, nobody really understands why they're so violent with each other. It's come out of a bubble. We just wish they'd stop it yeah. and stop embarrassing us. And that was, I suppose, that was uh, the Sunday Independent. That was the Irish Times. That was RT. And they're the kind of things that your average family consumes in the south of Ireland. I watched that interview that night. I suppose I became interested in republicanism, but much more than that, I actually just became interested in the North. And I think that Jerry Adams kind of just contextualized the conflict. He didn't seem overly partisan for one side. He just explained to a Southern audience just the nature of the conflict. And I'd never heard that before as a kid. So that's where my interest came um, in the North. And I was like, okay, there's something going on up there then that like we're not getting down here at all. And so began a lifelong obsession that still goes on today, where I'm with friends, my, you know, the average one of my buddies. They're getting more interested in the North, but they're traditionally disinterested. They're traditionally like, it's almost like, that's unfixable, whatever's going on up there. Let it just, you know, that's collateral damage and whatever happened with the British. Let it sort itself out. It'll sort itself out, yeah. We can't do anything to do it anyway. We have enough going on here. And we do have enough going on. That's the thing, that's the tragedy of it. I was speaking to Martine Anderson yesterday, and I was expecting her to be harder on the south when I put a similar question to her and she was like people have their own problems she understands why the average person in the south has traditionally been a little bit disinterested now I find it embarrassing it's something that has always embarrassed me and I feel ashamed that I'm part of a jurisdiction that just let their own people uh, abandon their own people in a sectarian gerrymandered state that I think that is one of the most that's a national disgrace that's never talked about and this shit moves me like so, so I feel like I want to try and do my own little bit about it. To go back to what you were saying, where it came from then, I think, so that, that, that impetus is there, but then I find myself at 17, 18, 19 going, fuck, I'm an alcoholic. And I'm not one of these f f uh, functional alcoholics. I would have loved to be one of them. I would have loved to be able to do the bit of work. <laughs> I would have loved to be able to be a good father. And you see people in their 50s and 60s and they're, probably alcoholics like but they have fully functional lives and stuff like not for me chaos straight away and depression and anxiety so I would say deep down inside I wanted to be the activist from the time that I was just reading about stuff in school and in college but I go drink and then I go missing for days on end and my world becomes quite small then do you know what I mean like yeah. I mean you know I what I'm talking about know what you mean. Yeah. yeah and when your world becomes small you know, anti-American anti imperialism, like, is we won't be able to get to that for a while because yeah. I need to get tablets. Uh, I need to ring in fucking sick to two or three. I, you know, an alcoholic has a chaotic life as well all the time. Well, like my certain my experience was at the height of my drinking, I had four jobs. So then I have four bosses to ring in sick for. There's ex-partners. I'm going through courts to see my, my daughter. I can't get to American imperialism this week, right? So what happened when I stopped drinking fully five years ago, five and a half, or is it six years ago now at this point? 2015 I finished. Yeah, six years ago, Jesus. Um, I kind of decided like, okay, first of all, as you know, it's a miracle that I'm still alive. And I mean that. I don't mean to be any more melodramatic than any other drunk, but we all should be dead, right? That's the first point. I got myself into situ. I'm not a fighting man. My brothers are tough men. They'd be out fighting and fucking hurling and getting into scrapes. <laughs> I was more kind of reading poetry under a tree type. I wasn't able to look after myself, but I was probably saucier than them because drink gave me this, you know, most alkies I think have a kind of a, a big ego and low self-esteem. So I used to find myself, I would tell my brothers I'd be places in Cork, like in the roughest of, of bars with the roughest of people. I'd tell my brothers where I'd been and their face would go ashen, like, because I'd just go anywhere for drink, you know, you know yourself, yeah, like, yeah, there's no limits, you know. 
I just go anywhere and get myself into scrapes, scrapes and barely kind of get out of them or whatever. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I found that I was getting myself sober. I couldn't believe it. It was a miracle. And the first year, I just buried myself in recovery. And when I came out of that then, I literally just kind of almost sat down with myself and, and very slowly began to say, okay, what do you want to do now? Why are you here? You know, I don't want to be like, a, I, I wasn't driven by fame. I'm not driven by, I love attention now, don't get me wrong. I love attention. I heard that about you. I heard that about you. <laughs> I love attention. I love annoying people. Um, and I love reaching out to people as well. I love coming up here and you speak to people that, you know, they might just say like, nice one for doing that sketch that just acknowledged the bullshit that we're dealing with. Can I can I give you a secret? Yeah. Just a wee a secret about about recovery. Yeah. And this is personal experience. Addicts are what we do. It's not what we are. And and I like many others have. If I had been a happy drunk, I'd have been a happy drunk. Like you, I was tormented by mm. almost schizophrenia. What what was happening? What I was destroying? How I was destroying? And all of that. So. I think there's a, there's a commonality that we all share, and that's why we seek those places where, you know, you get killed for sneezing, never mind for annoying anybody. Mm. Through all of that madness, and at a time, we're both here, but through all of that madness, was there, was there another person trying to get out? Was it a constant battle for you? I mean, were you, were you kind of going, oh, I don't want to drink, but I am drinking, I, I, I want to be, with my daughter, but but I'm with with the guys in the pub or whoever in the pub. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like it's. Were you unhappy? That's. The oh, problem. Jesus! I cu- I couldn't even. Well, you'll understand, but it's hard to to to, to well, describe. Try, try and explain. Try and explain. Like. It's almost like there's this original person, that's there. Like so, I was kind of like a happy-go-lucky kid. We weren't fucking uh, rich by any stretch of the imagination there was a lot of issues in the house but it was your average working class family in Cork and I had good solid parents and you know I fucking worshipped my dad my dad died when I was quite young but I but up until I started drinking I was a happy-go-lucky kid and for the first few years of drinking it was fucking brilliant like I loved it of course that's why I mean you don't hear this part of the you know, if you're sometimes you hear people talking about drinking and or even drugs, and the official line is like, "It's awful," um, you know, we got to get it, we got to get rid of it. Like, thank God, whatever. Sure, we wouldn't have been hooked in it if it wasn't amazing. Do you know? I loved being drunk. I was seeing counselors when I was was a young fella, like, and they'd say, "You know, why are you drinking?" Whatever, and you'd be like, "This is fucking great. Like, being drunk is brilliant. That's why I was doing it." Um, and that's grand for a while, but it gets to a point then where your head starts to drop. And your mental health starts deteriorating and you can't figure i actually i was stunned i was like a rabbit in headlights i was like how could this thing that is my best friend if i have it exactly yeah because for a while it was helping with work it was helping with uh meeting women it was helping with being gregarious because i'd be all right when i get on stage but to get me up there full of self-doubt uh feeling less than you know this this horrible crippling thing of feeling that you're better than everyone else because you've got this inflated ego that you created to just get through life, but also feeling that you're worse than everyone else at the same time. Like trying to manage yourself in that kind of schizophrenic state. Like, um, So I almost felt that the drinking took me out of what I originally was, which was I was a considerate enough young fella. I used to look out to see like, you know, I'd be worried about my fucking parents. I'd be trying to see if there's, I'm not saying I was, a, you know, Florence Nightingale, but I'd be like, you know, the neighbor's dog passed away, like I'd try and drop a nice word to the neighbor about the dog. But as soon as drinking kicked in, then I found that these little things started just, they don't matter anymore. And like, well, you know, well, I'll speak for myself, but I'm sure you understand the moral compass is, it's, it, it's gone. And that used to kill me because I'd wake up after binges and there'd be other people that I'd be with would be like, they seemed to be able to manage the fact that they were being destructive better than I was. I'd have to pretend that I was okay with it, but it used to just break my heart. And that's the thing that actually started my mental health deteriorating. We were doing some research last night about you, and I, I, I came across what I can only describe, and, and you have a different name for it, and it was the ice cream moment. It was been with your father, it was on a Saturday morning, I believe, and it was a, an ice cream cone and licking it and looking up at your father and going, that's my dad. That's my father. <laughs> yeah. 
and and that obviously comes from that sense of you know comfort and, and kindness and concern and all of that mm. and did you lose that you say you lost your way momentarily did that did that drift away when you were in the throes of addiction absolutely i i almost feel like i had a potentially unhealthy adoration of the man you know he just was an ordinary man but extraordinary in the way that he carried himself and you, you as you said at the top there it's the way that you it's what you do you know and he was like a guiding light for all of us in just his behavior there was nothing profound particularly profound he was saying it was all about actions and i never forgot that it was like he had no time for kind of sophistry like he'd no interest in the fella in the pub would be like i did this and i did that he just went about his business quietly talking about neighbors there was a neighbor one time brought in a cake this woman, I won't say her name, no in case her family are still alive, but uh, if we kicked our ball into her garden, she'd stab the ball. This is the type of woman she was now. I remember coming home with a stabbed ball one time. I was actually fucking traumatized. And uh, this woman was like a nightmare on the street. She came in with a cake one time and I opened the door and uh, she was at the door and I was like, oh my God, what's she doing here now? Is she plotting to kill me or what? And she had a cake for my old man and I brought in the cake. And uh, as it turns out, my dad had been doing little things for her like over a couple of months. And I, I swear to God, I've never, never no one knew because he didn't feel the need mm. uh, to come into the room and say, I need to remind you people again that I'm a good person because he knew there was all in the deed. I think he kind of, do you know the way like I've gone through a recovery program and I'm still going through it because you're never finished, as you know. Yeah. But I had to like really learn how to be somewhat good. And I, my father was innately somewhat good if that makes sense okay well I, I need to correct challenge me go on and not, no no not challenging not challenging because that's <laughs> you see you know addiction robs us of that yes it doesn't never replace it it robs us of that. yes and again as part of the research and, and, and talking to people everybody says the same thing about you that you're kind you're considerate you're observant you, you watch people and you watch things and and maybe that's the spin-off of recovery but you must have been like that and then the addiction kicked out of the play. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. That's nice, actually. Yeah, it's funny. There's a, it's funny you should say that now. There's a buddy in lives in London now, and he was listening. I did an interview with Mario Rosenstock uh, recently enough, and he listened to that, and he sent me a message saying, you're very hard on yourself. You're very, very hard on yourself. But, but I think being hard on yourself is good, though. I think being hard on yourself, do you not agree? No. <laughs> I, 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 without no. getting too philosophical. Yeah, do you know what? Because I want to move, I want to move you on to to your, what is euphemistically called your profession. But let me just say this, each of us and all of us need to love ourselves yeah. in order to love someone else. And if, without that, there's that, there's that gap, which is a learning gap and you can't do it. And that's my experience, but anyway. Can I push back on you for a second though? Absolutely. I do love myself and I accept totally what you're saying. And it's been a journey to love myself and I know that I do it now because I can say it to you yeah. openly without playing a role like, yeah. But I think accountability is very important as well. And just it's just been my journey that when I started to scrutinise the things that I had done to people and stop blaming other people, mm. like my mother, like my circumstances, like my school, like whatever, when I stopped the blame game and stopped being the victim, took responsibility for myself, Absolutely. things changed we're, for me. We're not that far apart. Yeah. You know, it's there's a happy medium in, in most Of things. course, yeah. I want to ask you about stand-up just briefly but and i also want to talk about about lockdown and about COVID and, and, and all of that and you mentioned that <clears throat> that that first step on the stage uh, you didn't use these words but i'm just trying to paraphrase it that it, it was both terrifying and you know wonderful it, was that in itself a kind of addiction <coughs> Maybe not so much stand-up because stand-up is something that I still struggle with this I almost feel like it's something that I should be doing right because I, I you know the the evidence is there That I can be funny, right? So the evidence oh, is mounting course, that yeah. I can be funny Absolutely. And then my head goes to a place of well, you should be doing You know the thing that you're good at and stand-up I suppose is the rawest version of comedy. There's also this thing <laughs> That I have where like if someone says that I that I can't do it or if there's a question or whether I can do it That's it. Then I, I lose two years on that Like if you say like oh, I, I couldn't see you as a scuba diver. You'll that's it. I'm gone. <laughs> I'm gone. I'm gone to Fiji then um, But so with stand-up 
stand-ups who don't really do sketch comedy and stuff, they feel that they're the rawest, purest form of the, of the art. Uh, I don't think it's an art, I think it's a craft. But anyway, I'll go and do that then just to spite them. But there's, there's definitely an addictive part to the stuff I've done afterwards where, like, I hate to admit it, but I just like to throw out kind of warts and all. Like, particularly on Twitter, when you're making sketches and some of them take off, like, there's a dopaminergic rush that you're getting to your numbers flying that I can't deny at all. Now, I'm talking like, in millions, just, just sometimes. for what it's yeah. like. Just to put that in the context. Yeah, and like you, you, so like the sketches I've done, as you say, where they would, they'd have over a million views and like the retweets and all this kind of stuff. If you take your eye off it for like a few seconds and other sketch comics who do better than I do would be able to tell you the same, that uh, you wouldn't, you, you'll actually miss comments like, because it's just rolling so quickly and it actually looks like a, a roulette. It's almost like you're in a casino because yeah, so you refresh, it's like, and it's like, it's set up obviously uh, and they know what they're doing, these companies as well. But, but it, uh, like, I'm a big boy. Like, RT is currently closed to me, yeah, shall I we say. Why. I wonder why. <laughs> so Twitter has stepped in where an RT is not open to me at the moment. Like, there's, there's, a, there's a, an RT show on television at the moment, a satirical show. And I, I feel that there, I, I may be the only living comic actor in Ireland. <laughs> not in it <laughs> i haven't noticed any others well i mean just for the record they, they turned they, they turned down father ted yeah so you're in pretty good company someone said to me that you're a great mimic well mimic not in i don't mean in impersonating voices but in terms of characters that you watch and you you observe and you have an ability of of getting the character quite right does that take effort i mean does it take a long time and of course it takes effort it's it's actually something that I'm hoping to get to do more of because I like the idea of like spending time with somebody and just kind of really matching the like I'd have to I usually have to be interested in someone though when I see like Oliver Callan who I think is fantastic and Mario Rosenstock who I pretty much consider a friend at this point like they're studying people that I think they may or may not be interested in I'd find that tough like so like they're like Roy Keane for instance I'm obsessed with Roy Keane so I find it handy enough to at least try some of the kind of the way that he kind of moves his body because I've been in a room with him and I see the way he he arches his back but I'd have to be interested in the person to kind of to, to do it I suppose but I admire the skill behind it completely like you know it's if you ever feel compelled to mimic me please please wear a wig <laughs> please, please give me a sure man I'm in the same boat as you follically full set of full set of her you mentioned briefly about your daughter and, and you've introduced her to the camera. A 17 year old? Yeah. What a nightmare. What a nightmare. <laughs> so, you know, you're in recovery, you're, you're, you're doing all these arts and parts and different things. Do you enjoy being a father? I, oh, I absolutely love being a father. Well, I love being a father to her. I don't know because I'm not a father to other people yet. Well, yet. Yeah, we'll take your word for it. Yeah, we'll see what happens. But, uh, but no, I love her so much, and, and you know what, we had this beautiful moment to pop back to recovery briefly where, you know, there's a part of, of recovery where you go through the stuff that you've done and you make amends to people, you know. So I had the extremely profound experience where I was able to talk to her one time, I was dropping her home and she was on my list of people that I wanted to make amends to. And she wouldn't remember a lot of the stuff and she didn't live with me at the time and, and stuff like that and she still doesn't live with me, actually I'm not claiming she lives with me. There'll be war over that comment. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, so I sat down with her, she was in the car, she was looking out, you know, she was, I don't know, 15 at the time, she's her own concerns, you know what I mean, she's on her phone, she's whatever's going on, uh, RuPaul's drag race is fucking on in a minute, like, and I was just looking out the window and I just said, you know, Cueve, look, it's, it's kind of slightly tricky thing to say, but like, you know, I'm sorry for not being a better dad in that period because you deserved a better dad and, you know, I love you and it wasn't really me in that period. I think this is kind of maybe the more, more me, the, the one that you've been presented with for the last kind of six years. And I expected her, I'd look turn around and she'd be like, what? Like, you know, <laughs> to be on her phone or something. And she had tears rolling down her face, you know. And it was actually like, it was, without sounding cheesy, it kind of made recovery. All that pain then was worth it for that one moment where like we looked at each other eye to eye and she said, and she said something like, you know, I'm just very proud of you. And we had a little hug. And I just thought, wow, you know, and, and, and then to tie it into the work as well like when you have experiences like that like you've gotten so low that you think this thing is going to beat you and now I'm in a position where I've come out the other side of it, it without being cheesy everything is a bonus 
and then you're about to make a sketch and you think, oh, that might piss Fina Gale off now, or you know, Simon Coven, you're gonna be happy with this one, or RT might and get back. These things don't matter. These things really don't matter. You gotta, you gotta kind of go, do, first of all, do I think it's funny? And like you said at the top as well, I'm never setting out to be nasty, believe it or not. I'm never oh, setting out to be nasty, it, yeah. yeah. I'm never trying to have a pop. The only people I've had, in, in my opinion at this point, I've had too many pops at, because I'd like to hold my hand up as well in the accountability thing. There's only so many times you can piss or you can take the piss out of loyalism, you know. And in my thinking now, I'm like, what more do I have to, you know? I think I've hopefully I've sent up the absurdist, almost Beckettian position that loyalism finds itself in, having fidelity to this thing that doesn't remember that it even owns it, let alone likes it in any way. I think that's funny. I still think that's funny, but there's only so many times you can repeat the joke, and I think I've done it too many times. And if I could do anything going forward in my work, I'd like to find a way to take the piss out of my own side more, insofar as I'm on a side, and to try and reach out to, to loyalism and unionism, which I'm trying to do at the moment. Well, I want to return to, to the future, but it does not mean yeah. pursue the lane. Because and, and, I, I suspect you're a far more complex person than you let people see. That's, that's what I'm trying to, I'm trying to get. And, and I think I have great sympathy with people <laughs> who are funny and who are challenged to be funny all the time. Because I don't think anybody's funny or ways or, or pleasant or, or good looking all the time. And I, and I have great sympathy with, yeah. with people who suffer from that. I want to talk to you very briefly, and, and this is a, a promise, I want to move on. When you are the father to your daughter, are you your father's father, a type of father? Or is this a, is this a see I have a feeling <laughs> you can't be both your children's friends and their parents, you're one or the other. Mm. So is there, do you draw from your father's experience? That, that's such an interesting question. Uh, what I try to do, I know what I'm trying to do anyway. What I'm trying to do is to be my father plus. So you know the way the Brits are looking for kind of Canada plus. Oh, absolutely. I, <laughs> I'm trying to be my father's natural, empathetic, beautiful, understated self, and I'm trying to tell her that I love her as well, because my father's from a different era. Like I don't oh, think he was kind of he wasn't telling me I, he loved I me too much. That. Like so, I try to do was that. Showing you. Oh, he was showing me exactly. He yeah. exactly. So I try to do that with her, but then again, without sounding kind of pretentious, I find if I find myself trying to do anything, I'm pro I'm probably after losing. So like just meeting her eye to eye and guiding her as best I can, and kind of being honest and open with her, that's better than. Also, I have to find my own way because I'm not my dad. Do you know what I mean? He 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 taught me stuff from the perspective of dad to son, but I can't then ape what he did. I have to try and find my own feet as a father, like, and that's been a journey as well, to be honest. But I think we're we're there now. I found it tough in early recovery. I think where I was kind of going, I need to make up now for stuff that I've done. So this girl needs to go to feckin' Disneyland like every month or something. You know, not that I had the money. But you know what I mean, like, yeah. whereas what you she wants is, love. you can't, and, yeah. and also she wants a, a sober, stable father, like, you know, do you know uh, <laughs> she doesn't like, she doesn't like that, <laughs> to be honest, she doesn't, she hates if anyone uh, spots me or whatever, but uh, what she wants is somebody to give her a lift, yeah. where she's going, I didn't realise that okay. I, you know, and I know these days, like, when I get into the car, and I'm bringing her somewhere, I think to myself, well, first of all, I can't believe I have a car, I cannot believe I have a car on the road, and that I haven't crashed it somewhere, that I haven't left it somewhere, that I, whatever. And second of all, that I'm still in her life and that I can provide like something practical for her, like giving her a lift somewhere. That's as, that's as much as I could have ever hoped for, to be honest. Recently, you, you came to Belfast for Fela and you done the scrapes at the Rock. Yeah. And I met you one of those dark, well, relatively dark Belfast, West Belfast nights. <laughs> and you just loved, <laughs> Within five minutes of meeting you, somebody rang, because I had told people that I'd met you in the rang, and they said, he's got a tweet up about, about Belfast. He's not come back to Cork. He just loves <laughs> Belfast. <laughs> I mean, covered that you love Derry. Not quite as much, but you love Derry. That's yeah. okay. Do you, is there a difference? Do you find a difference between the, the people in Belfast, the people in Cork, or, or is it, are people people wherever you get them? Yeah, pe people are people, I think. I just feel like it's, you know, I'm probably repeating myself from earlier now, but I, fe I felt myself anyway that there was a palpable thing the, the, the last time that I was in, particularly West Belfast, but Belfast generally when you're chatting to people that I think everyone is aware, shall we say, that there's this kind of mutual misunderstanding between the two jurisdictions. And I would love 
to play some tiny, tiny part in kind of breaking down some of those kind of barriers. And that's what it is. And you really feel like, you know, as I say to you, like when people were stopping and chatting to me, they were like, do you know, nice one for just, it's not, it's not like even a Republican thing, really, I don't think as much. It's more like, do you know, just almost like, thanks for thinking about us, yeah. like, because too many yeah. in the South don't. Yeah. Um, and that's the big thing that I, and, and like the, fu- the future of the, of the country as a United Ireland, it's, it's, not, it's not so much a Republican thing for some people. It's like, what would happen in a shared Ireland? Is it going to be kind of some sort of federacy of some point? Is it, what's it going to look like? Well, what it's definitely going to look like is more coordination between yeah. places. Now, what I'd also say, like, you, you also get this with, like, Dublin and kind of anywhere else in the South as well. Do you know what I mean? Like, so it's an opportunity to not just say, like, that, that there's a disconnect between North and South. There's a disconnect between Dublin and the rest of the country and rural Ireland. And I know, like, I speak to people in Donegal and they feel more forgotten about it. Like, I was mm. talking to somebody about this and it was like, Oh, geez, you know, you're mad for the north you now. Like, you know, <laughs> what about the border counties? Like, you know what I mean? You can't like, win. You can't win, like, you know. And you're right, and, and just as you're saying that, it's kind of a, a, a retracing TikToks that I've, I've watched and listened to you. The Palestinians, for instance, you defend the cause of the Palestinians. Mm. Do you see yourself in terms of. I know you're not a crusader for anything, so I'm not trying to suggest you are, but. Do you have an affinity with people who get it rough? Uh, whether it's Palestine, whether it's the North, whether it's Unionists getting misunderstood or whatever. Do you have that and is it just a natural reaction to the events? The thing that, that, the thing that connects all the issues that I'm interested in, I think, I was actually thinking about this, it's injustice. It's, it's any kind of little bit of injustice at all. I'm, I've just become aware, I suppose, the power of satire. I'm only, I'm only getting to the point now in my own career where when I first started doing stuff with RT as well, we were making comedy that was deliberately apolitical, right? And I think that's why we ended up on a bit of a journey with RT because they tend to, to stray away from, from biting satire. Mm. I think they're comfortable enough with satire that's kind of like, you know, oh, that's a funny impression of somebody that we know and love and there's a little jib in there but we'll be able to say hello to each other in the canteen. That for me is a satire that it, it doesn't have the true function of satire, which I think is to kind of, you need to destroy the thing in front of your eyes and then you rebuild it yourself in your own imagination as to what exactly is going on here and what maybe needs to change. I'm more interested in the second one, I think. Um, now, I've totally lost my train of thought. What did you ask me? What I was asking <laughs> you is that that sense of, what drives that sense of... Yeah, the injustice. Yeah. those who need to defend it. Yes, and I suppose, like, obviously, I would say Northern Nationalists and Northern Republicans and Palestinians would have so much in common, so much in common. And I feel like I'm not attracted to the Palestinian cause because I'm some sort of uh, Republican mogul that I'm getting information in my earpiece as to what the next cause fits in with the overall Sinn Féin narrative. I know people like to accuse you that on the internet that a lot of the issues that I'm interested in happen to be also inter- uh, uh, issues that Republicans are interested in. But I have my own volition. Oh, absolutely. I'm not attached to any party. I've never been no, paid. paid. Never, yeah, been, never had a yeah. cent in my life. from. And, and actually, the issues came first with me. I was interested in Irish unity a long time before I was even eligible to vote for any political party. So it's the issues that come first. But to, to, to sum up what I'm trying to say in terms of the satire, I definitely realised around the time that the videos were going crazy numbers wise. And I was thinking like, what can I do here now? Because I'm after doing a few things in around the kind of loyalism, Republicanism thing. I always was very passionate about Palestine. Even before I was started drinking, I just, I mean, it's one of the most ignored causes in the world really by the, the establishment. And the odds are against it in a way like, I'm not sure, is there another con- like, conflict like it on earth so when the numbers started going crazy on twitter i definitely decided to do something on that as long as i could make it funny and i talked to a couple of palestinian journalists as well to make sure that i could create something that they would feel is they're comfortable with because i'm trying to get the tone right i don't want to come in with something that actually adds damage Mm. that would defeat the purpose because i'm not trying to make myself out to be a star in the fucking cause i don't give a shit about any of that i'm trying to get the tone right and uh the idea doing the fundraiser then was like if this video goes crazy 
and there's a fundraiser attached to it, I wonder what it could earn. And I was kind of thinking like, uh, Jesus, if, if it earned like a few grand, I'd be fucking delighted. And I think it ended up with 33 grand. And awesome. at that point then, and by the way, now I'm not in any way saying that, kind of saying like, let's give me a pat on the back. It's actually the way people, and it's mostly Irish people, and I would say mostly, not, no, maybe not mostly, but a lot of people in the North contributed to that. And the generosity of Irish people, I was kind of thinking, okay, well, satire can actually make a practical difference here then. Because I talked to other comics and they're doubtful about that. They're like, well, does anything change with satire? It is an observation. Mm. It is absolutely powerful. Uh, absolutely powerful. The next question, we're joined by, with Claire with us today. And maybe yeah. the next question, she's off, she's off camera. The next question we should be asking Claire. But I'll ask you, and you can look at me and laugh at her at the same time. When you're not in recovery, when you're not writing scripts, when you're not uh, looking at, at, at the world as to what needs to be put right, when you're not getting this book ready in your head, what do you do? Do you like walking? Do you like cycling? Do you like journeys? Do you? Well, Claire would, would claim that I work too much. That's why I asked the question. Yeah, so, so actually to go back to something you said earlier, an, an obsession is work as well, to be honest with you, because... I do like all those things. I meditate. I meditate yeah, twice a day. Meditate. Twice, twice, twice a day. Yeah, it's transcendental meditation. Mm. But I'd be lying to you if I said that that's a hobby. I mean, I'm not. I'm not out walking. It, I, you know, I hang out with my friends. I've got, you know, I've got a few. <laughs> it's on like Roy Keane. No, I mean, I'm not. You know, I'm not a loner. Uh, you know, I have. I have friends. You know. Um, but I'll be honest with you. I, I do find getting that balance right, right, because. I am painting myself here as a guy who's kind of survived uh, alcoholism and then it's like, do you know what, I'm going to do these other things and I'm going to... I definitely went headlong into the work thing, all right, because I was thinking like, you've wasted so much time and I feel like wasted potential, I think, is I do find that a bit tragic, not just in myself but in other people as well and like, I, you know, without getting fucking sad and gloomy on it, like, I was hanging out with, with people who were very, very talented, like, wildly intelligent really talented people and some of them are no longer here or yeah. some of them are living in parks or some of them are uncontactable, they're gone off the grid. There is no doubt for a moment in my mind that we're the lucky ones. There's, there's no exactly doubt Exactly like, that. yeah. But at some stage I think we need to stop beating each, up, beating each other up or yeah. beating ourselves up. Yeah. And I think that, to, you know, the other side of the balance is that you don't swap one addiction for another addiction, whether it's work, whether it's politics, yeah. whether it's whatever. So, do you, I mean, you, you work too hard, clearly you do, but do you, would you take time out, would you kind of redress that, would you decide that you're going to go walk, would you do any of that? I would, I definitely would, I definitely would, I, 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 I do go for walks, I, when, my, when I'm with my daughter I generally don't, uh, we're not working, although I do, I have had her working most of the summer, right? <laughs> I suspect She's so cheap, like. Well, the labour's so cheap. I suspect if I ask Claire the same question, I'll get a different answer. <laughs> ah, Claire, we hang out a bit, don't we? We have a bit of a laugh, you know? Yeah. yeah. You can't hear her, but she's saying, like, she's giving big thumbs up. Well, that's not exactly what she was giving you, but we'll settle with that. In the last few months. Yeah. And the time has went so fast, I have to say. Yeah. I've loved it, actually. I really enjoyed it. Well, you haven't much choice. You have to say that, I suppose. <laughs> but, but, what's the future? What what have you planned that's attainable in the future? Well, as I. Well as the book. Yeah. Well, there's definitely a, there's definitely a book. I'd love to do. Uh, I'd love to do, TV. Um, sadly, I'd be kind of looking to to maybe the UK for the TV. Um, I've had a few conversations around that. I'm. I'm bringing a show to, so I have a show called In One Eye With The Other, mm -hmm. which was, it got some great reviews in Edinburgh and elsewhere. I'm bringing that to Belfast in January, but I'm also writing a new show called Gatman, which is a superhero story about a Cork boy who drinks cans and becomes a, becomes a superhero and fights crime on the streets of Cork and statues come to life and golden angels fly off cathedrals and stuff like that. So that's, that's happening and it's, it's going to be launched in September next year. Um, and I'm just going to keep making sketches around the, the topics that I'm passionate about. I have a sketch that I think people will enjoy coming up to Christmas, a, special, a Brexit special featuring uh, Europe as a beautiful woman uh, in a relationship with England and uh, Scotland is, is the kind of third wheel. And uh, yeah. I suspect, we've talked for an hour, and I suspect that that hour has just kind of scraped the surface and, and there'll be much more of tag. 
uh, as we develop. But for being here, for all the effort, you just came from Derry, you, you hadn't even had a cup of tea. So, Gourmet Nugget, thank you very much. Pleasure. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I, I did. I did, and I, yeah, an absolute pleasure to meet you, and thanks for having me.